Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the National Museums. We've had a, had a very good uh, stay over the last few years down in the Royal Society's premises in George Street. But it is nice to be back in the museum. Um, obviously, the museum and the, um, uh, the society go away back together. And uh, our director, uh, Simon Gilmore, has uh, negotiated a good deal for us with the museum. So I hope that uh, this is the, the recommencement of a, of a very happy relationship with our, our colleagues here. Um, I hope not too many of you went down to George Street and, and before you came here, of course. Um, Simon is uh, on leave tonight. We've uh, allowed him to take the night off because of his efforts. Um, uh, so uh, I'll be taking the, the, the meeting. So it's good to see so many fellows here, um, regular attenders, and I, I trust uh, fellows who don't normally come to these meetings in Edinburgh, uh, non-fellows, prospective members, and students. You're all welcome uh, for the start of our new season. And you'll notice that we have this um, screen that was, was rolling when you came in uh, of, the, uh, of the Dig Art comp winning entries in our uh, Dig Art competition. And Dig It, uh, the project, is of course still continuing uh, over the next year. I'm pleased also to announce that uh, we're offering uh, a new service uh, for fillers attending lectures. Um, you can now order our publications uh, online, uh, via email or over the phone, in advance of the lectures and uh, you can then pick up the books uh, when you come to the, the next lecture. Uh, so no need to pay postage. Um, and you can, in any case, um, place your orders in the normal way online. Uh, Vasiliki uh, is here, aren't you there? If you want to get more information about this, if, if you speak to Vasiliki after the lecture, and uh, she can explain the, the details for you. You'll also notice that the, the event, as ever, is, is being filmed for uh, online viewing. And uh, it's thanks to our sponsor, Sir Angus Grossert, uh, for making this possible. So, as ever, I have the um, minute of the, the last meeting, uh, which was held at uh, 6 p.m. in the Royal Society of Edinburgh, on Monday the 13th of April 2015, David Caldwell, President of the Society, in the chair. The minutes of the last meeting were read and approved, and the following communication was read. Antiquaries and archaeologists in the depiction of the hard edges of time by Stratford Halliday. And the same communication was read at 7.30 on Tuesday the 14th of April um, in the Regent Building in Aberdeen with Thimley McKeegan in the chair. So can I sign that as a correct record of the last meeting? I think that was a yes. <laughs> One of these days you'll not like me to do it, you know. So on to the main um, part of tonight's meeting which is uh, a lecture by Amy Blakeway um, of the University of Kent on a war of words propaganda in the wars of the rough wooings. Amy has fairly recently published um, a splendid book on uh, Regency in 16th century Scotland and is one of our leading experts on that period in our history, political history. Before um, going to Kent as a lecturer, she was a junior research fellow at the University of Cambridge and held the Fulbright Robertson Visiting Professorship in British History at Westminster College in Missouri. So it's with great pleasure that I invite uh, Amy to present her talk to us this evening. Thank you very much, David, and thank you, everybody, for coming to hear me talk this evening. 
Now, from 1543 until 1550, England and Scotland were engaged in the activity for which they were most famous prior to dynastic union in 1603, slogging each other's guts out in a lengthy, bloody and cruel way over the borders on both sides. The Rough Wooings, the name which we give to this war, are so called because they were fought over the marriage of Mary, Queen of Scots, depicted here on the first coin issued of her reign, and whether or not she would marry this chubby chap, Edward VI, son of Henry VIII of England. Now, when we think of wars, particularly between England and Scotland, we think of destruction. We think of burnt crops. We think of lives lost, we think of women raped. And it is quite right and correct that we associate these things with the word war. However, war can also lead to developments, to changes, to societies moving in new directions. And throughout the 16th and 17th centuries in Europe, the epoch known as the early modern era, one of the things that we associate with war that war prompted was the development of propaganda, of commentary of increased news and increased discussion. And we see this in contexts throughout Europe, ranging from the British civil wars of the 17th century to the French wars of religion in the 16th century. And the rough wooings, which we will talk about tonight, were no different. And indeed, we have some scholarship on this matter. Marcus Merriman, sadly, the late Marcus Merriman, now deceased, famously studied the English perspective on propaganda during the rough wooings. And he showed the ways in which Henry VIII's and later Edward VI's regime mastered the printing press to put forward their vision of an Anglo-Scottish Protestant union. Tonight, However, I want to do something slightly different. I want to talk about a new angle on this well-known story. And I want to talk about what the Scots and what their allies, the French, did in the arts of persuasion during this period. Hitherto, Franco-Scottish propaganda, and it is very much Franco-Scottish that we're thinking about this evening, has been neglected. I think this is for three main reasons. First, not very much survives. We only have three Scots tracts directly produced during the rough wooings. However, tonight I will be showing you there is strong circumstantial evidence. These were only a small part of a much larger genre. Secondly, not only did the tracts not survive, but in some cases, they were written in French and are therefore categorised now in archives under French rather than Scottish history. So when people go looking for stuff about this war, they don't find it because it's in the wrong box, or rather it's in a different box to where you think you'd go. Finally, I think the final reason why we've not thought about France and Scotland producing propaganda during this period is that at this moment in time, both countries were Catholic. And there are some faces in the room, I know, who are early modernists, and you will, of course, be familiar, and I'll share it for the rest of you, those who aren't maybe so familiar with the fact that for a long time we assumed that Protestantism, the religion of the word, the religion of the book, were masters of propaganda. Now, we're seeing this changing. We're accepting the Catholics were pretty good at the printing press too. And now we acknowledge this, it's time to think maybe the Catholic participants in this war were as good as their Protestant counterparts. So tonight what I'm going to do is I'm going to first talk about the circumstantial evidence for substantial Scots propaganda and then I'm going to move to examine this new French material. Before kicking off, however, um, because I'm aware not all of you have made my excellent life choices and become 16th century Scottish historians, I'm going to provide you with a quick crash revision course on the rough events of the rough wooings. Okay, 1542, the year before the wars start, England is Protestant, Henry VIII's Reformation is in full swing, swing rather, Scotland is Catholic. The two royal families at this juncture are very closely related, a relationship that goes back to the year 1502, when this couple, who I'm looking at on my computer, but who haven't come through on the slide here. Hello? Next slide. Yep. Oh, oh apparently I need to do this. 
This? No. No. Panic on the streets of London. It's all right. I don't need images. I'll go off piste. Remember that famous bit in the Labour Party conference where Tony Blair went off piste and everybody hated him afterwards? That's unfortunately what's about to happen here, I fear. Oh, hurrah, they've come. When this lovely couple, thank you, um, James IV of Scotland and Margaret Tudor, the eldest daughter of Henry VII of England, got married. They got married in 1503 at the terms of the Treaty of Perpetual Peace of 1502. Now, what this meant was that the two royal families were bound closely together. And what this meant was that potentially the kings and queens of Scots might inherit the throne of England. And therefore, from this moment onwards, England became extremely interested in who was on the throne of Scotland because they might end up on their own throne. And we won't really need this, um, but you know, just to sort of give you a quick idea of how this works, here down at the bottom is James VI. Um, and we can see how he inherited eventually the English throne through the failure of the Tudor line. So, when in 1542, Henry VIII's nephew, James V, um, here in a beautiful portrait by Corneille de Lyon, about ten years before his death, no, maybe six years before his death, died, um, this meant the English were extremely interested in who was going to succeed, and who indeed was going to succeed. A woman who you will all know the name of, Mary, Queen of Scots, only six days old. Now, this presented Uncle Henry VIII with a fantastic opportunity. He had a young son. The Scots had a young queen. If the two married, Henry would incorporate the realm of Scotland into his own realm without the expense of a conquest. And I think we get a bit of a sense of Henry VIII's mentality at this time with this delightful picture. Um, you know, I mean, look at those... That is a mean mouth. That is a mean man there. However, much as that might have been Henry VIII's objective, this was not a vision of the future scared, shared by many Scots. And here we can see three of the main people who were really involved in ensuring that this didn't come to pass. Over here, James Hamilton, Earl of Arran, next in line to the throne after Mary, Queen of Scots, and appointed regent upon James V's death. Over here, Mary, Queen of Scots' mother, Mary of Guise, eldest daughter of the powerful Duke of Guise in France, who really kept the old alliance going. And up here, Cardinal David Beaton, sadly not a contemporary portrait, the head of the Catholic Church in Scotland. No way was he going to allow Protestantism to come in. So from 1543 onwards, England and Scotland began slogging it out. Key points of the war, probably include in 1546 when Cardinal Beaton was assassinated. Um, I had to include this because I found this fabulous cigarette card. Who knew it? Cardinal Beaton on cigarette cards. Um, so 1546, Cardinal Beaton was assassinated. And this is actually crucial because it's the last year, really, where the Scots are sort of be trying to do this as an independent operation. Because in 1547, they were... We'll come, we'll come back to that in a second. In 1547... They were defeated at the Battle of Pinkey. Now, this is a contemporary English image, and I just want to pause for a moment to draw your attention to this chap here. That is God, um, and he is putting thunderbolts down, which are scattering the Scottish forces. And I think we can really see here the importance of propaganda, even in an image produced for very limited circulation. So after the English victory at Pinkey, um, the Scots were really with their backs against the wall. And the following year, in 1548, they signed a treaty with, Fran with France, whereby Mary, Queen of Scots, would marry the Dauphin, the heir to the French throne, and in return, the French would provide massive military assistance for the Scots in terms of resisting the English. After the French arrived in 1548, the war was pretty much a done deal um, in 1548. 50, the Treaty of Boulogne was signed to declare peace between England and France. And the following year, the Treaty of Norham was signed and England and Scotland were at peace. So a lot of events in a very confined period of time, less than a decade. But that's to give you a very rough sense of the rough wounds and some of the people and events I'll mention as we go on. OK, now I said that the English propaganda is quite well known. I'm just going to remind and rehearse some of the key arguments that's being put forward at the moment by the English. 
Now, this is a good place to start. James Henderson, an exhortation to the Scots. Now, Henderson is an interesting character. You can tell from the name he was, in fact, a Scot. He was an Anglophile Scot because of his Protestantism. And in his work, Henderson argued that, um, effectively, England and Scotland were chosen by God to come together, that God had made this match in heaven between Mary and Edward, and that, really, people who were resisting this were resisting the very will of God himself. So this is a very strong line of argumentation that the English are putting forward. There are older arguments as well in circulation. The English also argue that Scotland is their territory, that they have overlordship over it. That still remains in circulation, but it's not the key argument that's being pushed to the Scots. The key argument the Scots are front-loaded with is this one about the divinely ordained marriage. So what did the Scots say in response? Unfortunately, we don't have very many texts actually telling us what the Scots said in in response. So how do I know it happened? Well, ironically, the first piece of evidence I've got, the Scots are producing significant propaganda of their own, is from Henderson himself. In this book, The Godly and Golden Book for the Concord of England and Scotland, produced only in manuscript in the year 1547, the same year as the previous book, And in this, Henderson is giving advice to the English as to what they are going to do if and when they conquer Scotland. And we can see the bit of advice that he's interested in here. And what this text says is Henderson hopes that in order that when England and Scotland finally come together and are joined, he wants two judicial sessions to be held. One is in Edinburgh and one in Aberdeen. Obviously, he's having a psychic foreshadowing of my lecturing that I'm doing at the moment, several hundred years earlier. These two judicial sessions in Edinburgh and Aberdeen. And they're to be held, led by prudent religious men, by which he means, of course, Protestants. And these are to be held in order that our people shall no more be moved to rancour and ire either by feigned prophecies, books, battles and chronicles against the verity, composed by seditious persons, and all such will be burnt and destroyed forever. Clearly, Henderson is worried about a substantial circulation of material. He mentions four distinct genres there, and they're ranging ranging, ranging from the quite informal to the quite formal. We're going from something that's sort of a rumour heard on the street almost to a large book, a chronicle that might be an expensive luxury item. And let's focus on chronicles for a minute. What kind of things might he have had specifically in mind? I reckon there's one particular candidate here, and that's Blind Harry's book, The Book of the Wallace. Now, this is first published and produced in a much earlier context. However, we've got evidence of it being purchased by people like the governor, the Earl of Arran, in 1548. Clearly, this is in circulation amongst elite Scots at the time. Okay, so Henderson's worried about it. The stuff being produced, have we got any more direct evidence? We've got one moment, one really interesting moment coming through in 1548 where what happens is that the English issue a proclamation claiming and outlining these classic arguments outlaid by Henderson, and then in response, the Scots issue their own proclamation. Now, the text itself doesn't survive. What do we have instead? We have the payments to the messengers told to go and issue this proclamation throughout Scotland. And it talks specifically about winning away seduced hearts from the English. And we have many more records, not of proclamations, but of payments to messengers told to proclaim them. So the Scots are clearly fighting back. And moreover, these proclamations are engaging in a tit-for-tat argument. We're used to thinking about the proclamations of this period as a one-way tirade 
the English shouting at the beleaguered lowland Scots, but actually we're looking at a mutual dialogue here. Let's take another example. In 1549, when the governor issued a proclamation arguing that any Scots caught fighting in the English armison, the likes of Henderson, who produced this, would not be given the right of prisoners' quarter. Instead, they would be killed instantly as traitors. Again, we don't know what we haven't got the original text of this. What we have is the English response. And the English response is quite interesting. The English response is that this shouldn't be used as practice between Christian realms. Now, okay, yeah, England, Scotland. England, Scotland, they're both, they're both Christian, right? They're Protestant and they're Catholic. Not from the context of the 1530s. We've got a heretic, schismatic nation and one with the pure faith. And depending on which side of the border you're standing on, you're going to think one is one or one is the other. So the English are doing something, forced into quite an interesting position here. They're being forced to accept, one, that the Scots are Christian, and two, that they are an independent realm which undermined all their own propaganda, all their own claims that Scotland, in fact, owed allegiance and suzerainty to the English crown. Now, it's far from a new contention that the English were using proclamations, but what I think I've shown there, I hope I've shown at least, with those two examples, is that they're not the only ones focusing on the printing press, and they're not the only ones engaging in this kind of dialogue. I said there wasn't much evidence for Scott's proclamations, and unfortunately there's only so long you can talk about proclamations where the texts don't survive. So we're now going to turn to the lecture, part of the lecture, where I have substantially more meat, thinking about the French responses to the rough wooings. So cast your eyes south, cast your eyes south beyond Berwick, cast your eyes south beyond London, cast your eyes south into France, the beating heart of Renaissance Europe. When I'm talking to my students and I'm trying to explain how important France was in the 16th century, what I say is think about China and America in today's global politics, roll them into one, but with a lot more class and far better wine. So thinking about Renaissance France, think of it as this absolute, complete, beating superpower. So what were the French saying? I think we can helpfully group French propaganda on the rough wooings into two areas. The first is stuff deliberately written for the rough wooings. The second, um, in a great sort of austerity Britain prelude here, is recycled propaganda, because the French have been fighting the English for a long time as well. And so they recycle an awful lot of the old ideas that they have. Now, before I focus in on this French material, there's two things that I want to emphasise. Firstly, these are hugely varied. We think about propaganda and we maybe have certain assumptions about what it might be like. Try and cast those aside. The French are taking every type of genre, every type of text imaginable and turning it to good use here. But they're not just varied in form, they're varied in content. And this is something that I think is also important to try and draw out of tonight's talk. We've seen already James Henderson, a Scot who was in favour of the English marriage. We also see French people who believe that England and Scotland ought to unite, and we will come to them later on. We're going to deal with the recycled texts first, I think, because they provide some helpful background for the types of ideas that are circulating. So what were they saying? Well, interestingly, the French decide to try and critique the English through Henry VIII's marital shenanigans. They decide to hit the English where it hurts, which is what, with what Henry VIII has been getting up to. So we've got poems circulating, talking about the evils of Anne Boleyn, who stole Henry away from Catherine of Aragon, and of Henry's tyrannous cruelty in then executing her. We've also got poems recounting his divorce from Anne of Cleves, his fourth wife, um, known rather unfairly, I think, as the Flanders Mare. And we've got one poem which is a long plea in her voice, her first person voice, explaining why Henry is being cruel and, un and, um, and unhusband-like towards her. Now, these two texts are particularly interesting because Henry VIII's marriage is old news by the 1540s. When they were first issued, they were subject to state censorship in France. But in the 1540s, they're reissued in many, many multiple editions. 
And we think there is tacit crown, well, I certainly think there's tacit crown approval behind that there. In focusing on Henry VIII, the reader is invited, I think, of these texts to extrapolate. If he is a tyrant and he is cruel, so are all of his subjects, so is his realm. And this is echoed through all of the French material. In this period, the best justification for war is claiming that you have a pre-existing right to a given territory. We've seen this was an English justification for their war with Scotland. The Scots ought to be English subjects, and they're asserting their overlordship. But what's interesting is this is also English justification for war in France. Think of Shakespeare's Henry V. Anyone vaguely familiar with Henry V? Yeah? Some feedback. Okay. Henry V makes huge conquests in France. And this provides the basis for the English claiming throughout the 16th century that they ought to be the monarchs of France as well. And so when the French are recycling propaganda material, claiming that the English have a tendency to claim territory that's not actually legally theirs, they've got an awful lot of stuff to, join, to draw back on. One example here, my favourite example, um, is one which has got the title which translates as the spirit of Henry VII from the Elysian fields talking to his son who presently reigned. Now this is first published in 1512 in the context of Henry VIII's first military campaign. So the circumstances exactly mirror those of the 1540s in Scotland. Henry VIII is claiming territory and he's also incidentally doing this in France at the same time. And indeed, it appears in multiple editions throughout the 1530s, in the 1540s, rather. OK, so what's happening? So the ghostly Henry VII has heard from heaven about what's going on down in the world of men. And he's really not happy. He thinks his son, Henry VIII, is very much overstepping the line. So he comes to give a little bit of advice. The first thing he does is he reminds his son that the English have a reputation for killing their kings. If you stick around in England for long enough, he says, the English will turn their regicidal nature towards you. And therefore, you shouldn't be fighting with your neighbours, because when the English do eventually turn against you, you're going to be stuck with your back against the wall. And what he argues here then, and I think this is quite interesting, that not only are the English dangerous, but that Henry VIII ought to be pleased with France because he claims that actually France has effectively given England and Henry given England to the Tudor dynasty. And he, tra- he gives an interesting passage that says, you know, this is the translation, first you must realise, if you want to understand my reasoning, the French are the cause of your well-being, and without them I would be nothing. So this is a claim that the English not only don't have any right to territories in France, but it questions their legitimacy to their own realm. It's effectively positioning the English as usurpers, and as usurpers, effectively, as tyrants. So this author is making a very clear claim that the English don't have any right to the territories they're claiming in France. What about Scotland? Now, his comments here are surprisingly ambiguous. Because in order to rebut the claims that the English are making to territories in France, he effectively accepts the claims the English are making about Scotland. And he claims, just as Wales was conquered by our forefathers over the Welsh, so were fiefs taken against the Scots. So were fiefs taken against the Scots. Now, when I first read this, I absolutely couldn't believe this, and I should have opened this lecture by saying this is a new research project, and what you're getting here is the first time any of this has been aired, so I'm very much looking forward to your feedback. But I found this absolutely incredible. During the 1540s, a Frenchman going into print, saying that he thinks the English might have a point about what they're claiming about Scotland. Now, why might a Frenchman be claiming this? Well, It could be that the English propaganda directed towards the French was working. Let's take an example of this propaganda. December 1548, Edward VI has come to the throne of England, Henry Henry VIII has died, and his protector, the equivalent of the Scottish regent, has a little tete-a-tete with the French ambassador. 
During the course of this conversation, Protector Somerset said to the French ambassador, you know, you really ought to consider the, um, the rightness of our claims against the Scots. The French ambassador said, oh, I'm not here to talk about Scotland, I'm here to talk about France. Somerset, however, won't be put off. And he has ready a great number of ancient and authentic writings proving the English claims towards Scotland. So in focusing on this tract, I think what we're actually adding in here are two really important new angles to thinking about the rough wooings. One, the efficacy of English propaganda towards the French, an angle which we've not thought about before at all, and also the fact that within France, not everybody is keen on the Scottish theatre, as it is almost universally, almost universally called in France. Now, as I said, this is new research. Unfortunately, I've not fully investigated the implications of this claim that the English have suzerainty over Scotland and its acceptance within France. But what I think it is important to say is that we really need to move our understanding of 16th century politics beyond a simplistic old alliance versus old enemy. We need to start getting to a more nuanced understanding of relations amongst the three countries. Okay, that's quite a depressing um, place to conclude our discussion of the recycled propaganda produced by and for the Scots during this period. Instead, we're now going to turn to the stuff that's specifically produced about the War of Scot in Scotland during the 1540s. Let's start with the only tract directly commenting on the Scottish aspects of the war, which survives the dates from April 1544. The title of this piece is in translation, The Defeat of the English by the Scots on Holy Tuesday. And it claims that the Scots have just won a great victory over the English. They've burnt 80 English ships, they're now on the course of invading England, and they've almost reached London. Included in this, the Scots, or the Scots victory is put alongside two other victories. One by the French over the Imperial, um, the Holy Roman Emperor's forces at Caragino in Italy, and the other by Barbarossa, the um, name the Western Europeans give to the Ottoman Admiral Hayadreddin Pasha, over again the imperial forces and the Holy Roman Empire at this point is England's ally. So we're talking about three major victories by the Franco-Scottish force over England and her allies. Now there's a bit of a problem with this tract. Um, the French victory in Italy at Caragino definitely happened. And we also know that the Ottoman victory definitely happened. Unfortunately, this claim that there was a massive Scots victory burning 80 ships, followed up with a land march to England that nearly reached London, didn't happen. So we're presented with quite an interesting problem in this French propaganda. This is being presented as news, as real current events, and in fact, there is no evidence at all that it happened. We've got two options here. One, the author is repeating something they genuinely believe to be true. They believe that this victory happened. And there is evidence that there are rumours of this so-called victory circulating widely throughout Europe during this period. And if, for example, um, June, so a few months after this is published, the rumours are circulating in Venice. But it's also possible, this is a deliberate lie, it's also possible that by bundling this false victory in with these two real ones, someone is deliberately trying to create a sense of greater success in the Scottish theatre than in fact existed. And if we've got people in France who were not so keen on the war with England um, and thought you know, maybe the English did have a point, as I think I've just shown, or I hope I've just shown anyway, then we see why such propaganda might be needed. We need to show that this is victorious because, of course, in the 16th century understanding, a victory is a sign from God that he wants you to win and that you are doing the right thing. The close relationship in this tract between propaganda and news is, however, visible really strongly in the final and I think most interesting tract I want to talk about today. The title of this translates as the response of the English people to their King Edward on certain articles which in his name have been sent to them touching the Christian religion. 
The tract was published in 1550 at Paris, and as the title suggests, it appears in the form of a letter written by the English people to Edward VI, responding to instructions which he has in turn issued to them. And it responds to a real political situation. In 1549, England was not only engaged with war with France and war with Scotland, England was engaged in putting down rebellions within itself, particularly in Norfolk and in the West Country around and in Cornwall. Now, how did this tract come to light? It's being produced in France. How did the English find out about it? Well, for that, we've got this man to thank. I'm going to pause over him for a minute because I rather like Mason. Um, does anybody else think he looks stressed out? <laughs> Doesn't he look agitated? Sir John Mason, English ambassador to France, 1550 to 1. Um, God knows what he'd done to deserve this, because it's probably the worst job going in the English diplomatic corps at this time. And he looks as agitated as you'd suggest his job would be. But what I also like about this portrait of Mason, not only is it showing how agitated he is, but is the fact he's holding here this letter... We don't know if it's a letter, it's a piece of paper. And this points our attention to one of the really fundamental roles of early modern ambassadors. We think of ambassadors as being doing high diplomacy between countries, for countries. In the early modern world in the 16th century, a crucial role of ambassadors was acquiring information, acquiring news in the country where they were resident, and disseminating it to their home country. So in this period, ambassadors are more than straightforward diplomats. They're also sort of the equivalent of, I suppose, the BBC Foreign Service, all rolled into one in the embassy. So when Mason, one day in 1550, acquired this tract, this response of the English people to their King Edward, his first duty was to write home to London about it and tell the English government what was being said about them. And his second duty was to find out who the hell had produced it and to make sure they didn't say anything else like it. So what were they saying that was causing so much problem? Why was this response to Edward VI so problematic? Now, what's interesting is it falls into two halves. The first half is a critique of English domestic policy. And what's really interesting here is that in this half of the tract, the author is basically translating materials that he has acquired from England that were indeed produced by the rebel army. About halfway through, however... The tenor of the tract changes completely, and the author turns what was an aside in the original English material into the start of a new section. The translating of English material claimed that um, the rebels were not in any way, shape or form uh, defeating or compromising the objectives of the English in the international theatres of Scotland and France. And in the original English text, this is, left as a te this is left as a standalone point, and the author moved on. What this author, this French author did, however, was develop that into a much larger argument. And he goes on to say, and incidentally, Edward VI, call yourself a Christian monarch? Call yourself a Christian monarch fighting a child, a fatherless child, who is not only a fatherless child, to whom as a king you have a duty of protection, but your cousin. And this then leads into a lengthy critique of the English rights in Scotland, both in religious terms and in terms of the suzerainty argument. Now, clearly, this English author was writing with English books on his desk. I've just said the first half of it was a translation. But what's interesting is he's also writing, I think, with Scottish materials too. The arguments that he picks up on in why the English have no claim to the realm of Scotland reflect the ones that are implied in the proclamations that were issued and also which do exist in the three Scottish tracts which do indeed discuss these problems. OK, what happened when the English found out about it? Well, the Privy Council wrote back to Sir John Mason very quickly and told him that he needed to sort it out. Um, and they asked him first who was the author. Mason's initial suspicion? Some Scot hath been the actor, author thereof, or at least a helper in the matter. 
Why would Sir John Mason think a Scot was writing a French book in 1550? Well, in this year, Mary of Guise, who we saw the picture of earlier on, the Queen, um, Queen Mother Mary, Queen of Scots's mum, has just arrived in Paris, accompanied by a huge train of Scots. We've been trained to think about this visit as being a brainwashing activity, whereby the Scots with Mary of Guise are being encouraged to think about the union with France as being a positive thing. Mason's suspicion that it's the Scots producing this French language propaganda suggests perhaps actually, yes, it was a propaganda campaign, but it was the other way around. The Scots were trying to persuade the French away from the views that they'd imbibed from the English and which we discussed earlier on that some French people believed that the English did indeed have suzerainty rights over Scotland. Mason went to complain to the French Privy Council, um, where he made a great speech declaring the lewdness of the device to the leading nobles of France. Interestingly, the French Privy Council delay hearing Mason. They put him off for three months. So does that mean they're aware of the book? Does that mean they're concerned about the book? Or does that just mean they're busy? It's not quite clear, and there certainly was a lot of pastime, as they called it, taking place in the French court over Christmas and the New Year. When this poor, beleaguered John Mason, the English ambassador, did finally get to the Privy Council, however, and made his complaint, the French Chancellor responded that, you know, actually, you're saying the same about us. Why should we bother to catch in this book that's critical of the English if you are going to print material which is nasty about the French. Nevertheless, the French Chancellor promised that they would see, the English would see that the French liked not this manner of touching princes. And they promised to prepare letters to issue to the printers of France to tell them not to produce this. Unfortunately, however, they were slightly too late, or certainly from Mason's perspective, because in the meantime, a second edition of La Réponse, the response tract, had been published. Um, and this claimed that the first one had been a runaway bestseller success, selling over 2,000 copies. Now, in early modern terms, a print run, maybe 500 copies for a big book, this is a huge runaway success if over 2,000 have indeed really been sold. Alongside this official route through the French Privy Council, however, the English ambassador pursued his own more secret, more informal methods of communication, and this did yield fruit. He quickly discovered that the author wasn't actually a Scot, as he'd assumed. It was a Frenchman, Peter Hogue, who, Mason said, hath long served in practices of dissension between the subjects and their prince, against whom this king has hostility. So what he's claiming there is that Hogue is effectively a French agent who seeks to help French diplomacy by causing rebellion between princes with whom the French are at war and, the Engl and their subjects, weakening the position of the King of France's enemies by creating internal dissension at home. Mason told the French Privy Council that he reckoned it was Hogue, um, but unfortunately, from um, his perspective, the French were unable to catch Hogue. By this point, he'd gone away into the Holy Roman Empire, and um, we do indeed have evidence of him publishing other things in future. So clearly, this didn't actually stop his career. But although Hogue had written the tract, actually, I think the more interesting person is the man until who until recently, um, the man with whom until recently he had served as secretary, a man called Jean de Monluc. Now, as this man's secretary, Hogue had visited Ireland and Scotland, and interestingly here, was at the commotion time in habit dissembled in England. Effectively, therefore, we know that the author of this tract had been in England during the time of the 1549 rebellions. And so the mystery of where he'd got the English material on which he was drawing, and indeed the Scots text, is instantly cleared up. This, in this discovery, however, that it was Monluck who had probably um, authorised or certainly encouraged Hogue to write the tract, really enraged Mason. On his arrival in France, Monluck had pretended to be friendly towards him and he engaged in conversation with Mason throughout his embassy. 
even though behind his back he was claiming that he'd nearly brought all of Ireland into the allegiance of the Kingdom of France and also claimed that if the Anglo-French Entente failed, he would be able to return to Ireland and raise all of Ireland in rebellion within four months. Moreover, in late December 1550, again behind Mason's back, Monluck, before a right good assembly within the court, had made a study duration with the intention of encouraging the continuance of the war against the English and declaring the likelihood of English success therein to be linked to a lack of government, of obedience, of victual, of captains, of money and munitions. And the people, he went on to claim, were never so ill-contented. In other words, despite the fact that in 1550, after the Anglo-French peace treaty had been signed, there are still dissenting voices within France who want to encourage and first set this war further. So, so far, the French attempts to control this material seem pretty ineffective, and this fits fairly well with what we know about early modern censorship generally. However, they did score one apparently large success. The text, the response, had been produced without any printer, without any author, hence, of course, the fact that Mason had had to spend so long trying to get any information whatsoever about the tract. However, eventually, presumably by matching the different types of prints, they did find out that Massillon was the printer, Robert Massillon, a Parisian printer. And the Privy Council of France searched his house and banned him from printing in the short term. And so here, again, we can see a tension between what's being circulated as news within France and official government policy. And indeed, La Réponse was the last tract, either Scots, English or French, to engage with any kinds of these issues. And as such, you'll probably be quite glad to know that this is where we're going to conclude our paper. The suppression of this piece did point to a split of opinion within France over the continued desirability of conflict with England. And this is significant, I think, for two reasons, two big points I want to take away from this. First, it's significant because it shows us that the war of words, the propaganda war, which accompanied the rough wooings, lasted longer than the original physical conflict. And so when we're thinking about this, we need to spread the net that we're thinking out broad, more broadly, chronologically. Secondly, I think that Repens is an interesting place to conclude because it reminds us that of the three countries involved, each contained a split and a division within their opinion, and that this is reflected and articulated in the propaganda that was produced. And thirdly, I think it reminds us that when we think about propaganda, we need to make sure that we're thinking about this three-way negotiation. This is not just the English talking one way to the Scots. This is the English talking to the French, the Scots talking to the French, and the French talking back to the English and the Scots. So propaganda in the rough wooings sounds something that I am sounds like something that will be focused very much on Scotland. But this evening we've travelled far and wide. We've travelled down south to Paris. We've travelled to Rouen. Um, we've also even travelled, I suppose, to Cornwall, thinking about the English rebellions, which prompted and engaged with some of this material. I hope that some of what I've said this evening has been interesting. But what I hope it's done more than that is that encouraged you to think in a slightly different way about the old alliance, the old enemy, and the relationship between England and France and Scotland during this mid-century period. Thank you very much. So there's just one slide I'm going to put up, actually. Um, I wouldn't mind if we could have it. In case you want to find out more, this is a really good book to go to, and that's my email address if you've got any questions. Thank you very much indeed, Amy. That was a splendid presentation. So have we any comments or questions from anybody in the audience? For Amy? Yes. Uh, Facilicate. We've got a, a microphone for you. Ooh. 
Hello, just a wee question about the um, the portrait you just showed of yeah. uh, Sir John Mason there. I was rather taken by the lion rampant in the top corner. What's that doing there? Uh, that, let's go back to it so everyone can see. Um, I think that's indicative of his service with England. Um, this is probably um, an attempt to, obviously it's, it's, it looks like the Scottish crest, um, but I think there's, there's, two possible in, there's two possible limitations. One is that this portrait is not very clean and that this is actually a crest that looks a bit like the Scottish crest but relates to an English noble house. I don't know exactly, so I'm guessing here. Um, the other one is that this is indicative of his service for England in the Scottish theatre. And we do occasionally see the English nobility and English diplomatic servants at this time um, being portrayed with the emblems of countries with whom they were engaged. Um, a classic example here will be um, the Dukes of Norfolk, um, who occasionally are portrayed with having bits of Scottish banners around them because they were actively involved in fighting the Scots an awful lot. So... I don't know, but those are my two guesses. One is it's a dirty crest that looks like our lion rampant, but isn't. And the other is it's a direct reference to that service. So just to follow up, do you know where, where is that? No, I don't. Oh, OK. Sorry. Um, <laughs> however, if you've got access to the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, Mason's entry will undoubtedly tell you where the portrait is. Lady at the back. OK. A shield, yes, yeah. yeah. They're always set in his personal arms. You reckon? That would always appear on a portrait yeah. period. The arms of Norfolk contain an augmentation of the royal arms mm. of Scotland, but modern. Okay. So there's always set in the history of John Mason's Yeah. Arms. Okay. Well, in that case, it's interesting because obviously he's sort of, he gets made a knight, so he's probably been given the crest in that case, I would imagine. Um, I don't know. No? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for that. Probably answered your question better than I could. Could I pick up your second point at the end? Yes. About in each country there are different groups yeah. with different views. And I was thinking that as you, your lecture progressed. And yeah. I was thinking particularly, in, as you say, France very centralised, King very strong. Mm. So I mean, could you just say another, a few words about um, the sort of nature of these two groups? How, how do you end up with, I mean, this is just the court courtiers vying for different views of foreign policy? Yeah, okay, very interesting question. Um, so, in terms of the groups within France, um, I think the division we need to see here is primarily perhaps a religious one rather than a court-based one. Um, Catholics within France, sort of everybody's Catholic, but there are people who are more fiercely committed to the idea of militant Catholicism, a militant crusade against the English. And I think... Um, the people associated with this tract, Hogue and Monarch, are definitely part of that ultra, sort of ultra-Catholic group who don't want to compromise with the Protestants. Um, so I think we're seeing a balance here within the French court between those people who believe that, yeah, you could just about do business with Protestants and that that's okay and that's something that you could certainly manage for the greater good of La France, and a group who believe that actually, no, these guys are heretics, and we really shouldn't be compromising with them at all. So I think that that's the nature of the groups. What is interesting is that we have other evidence that I didn't go into, that that group particularly target the Guise family, Mary of Guise's family, to try and win them round to their cause, even after the Guise have said, yeah, OK, we'll go for peace in Scotland. So they clearly think they've got an in there. And for those of you sort of with knowledge of French history, obviously we know later in the century, Les Guise do become ultra-Catholics. So I've been wondering, are we beginning to see those first tentative steps down that road? I don't know. Um, how does Mary, Queen of Scots' marriage into the French royal family fit into this? Absolutely critical. Um, 1548, the Treaty of Haddington is agreed, and at that moment, um, negotiations begin in earnest for Mary to go and live in France. And it's at that moment that the French really ramp up their interest in Scotland. Um, and so it's from that moment that the stakes get higher. 
And what that means is that the French are spending a lot more in Scotland. And there is dissent within France about the amount that is being said. And when I was talking about the authors who were saying, actually, there's English suzerainty, you know, maybe there's something in that, maybe we ought to accept it. The next stage in the research is going to be partly about seeing whether or not they are also linked to this faction who are not happy about the cost of the war. So it's critical in as much as it changes the game completely in terms of the war. In the short term, however, it is not something that appears and is discussed in the tract, because at the moment, um, it's just a promise of marriage. And early modern princes break their contracts of marriage all the time. So although we think it's going to happen, and obviously we know it is going to happen 10 years later, actually at that moment, it's a potential. And what we have is the reality of spiralling French expenditure and a lot of French people dying in Scotland as well. And I think it's that that really kicks it. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Hello, Miles. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah. Um, but thank you. Marvellous paper. Um, I you. take it the materials don't give you any sense of change over time. I'm thinking in terms of yeah. uh, the English brutality of 45, which brings a lot of Scottish Protestants back onto the Scottish side. Yeah. Is anything there? Um, that's a really excellent question. Um, no, I, there isn't enough. There are not enough items that remain extant for me to be confident making change over time arguments. Um, what I think would be the best way of measuring loyalty within Scotland on change over time would be looking if, at the moment, more brutality starts happening, we see an increased number of remissions for treason. Um, and a remission for treason is basically you've done something traitorous, like sold corn to the English. Um, you go to the governor and you say, I'm really sorry, I did this treasonous thing. And he says, oh, OK, well, pay me 20 shillings and I'll let you off and you can be a good Scot again. So I think the way of tracking changing loyalties would be to look through the frequency of people applying for remission for treason rather than anything else. Um, I, I wish I could track it through the propaganda, but sadly there's just not enough that remains extant. Anything else? Hi. I didn't catch who was the author of the report on the meeting between the French ambassador and the text of Somerset. That's Somerset writing to the English ambassador in France. Um, that's very much part of a dual campaign that they're, what they're running at that time. It's not Mason at this point, it's the, his predecessor, Wooden. And um, Wooden is very much being briefed on Somerset of the kind of things he's meant to tell in the French court. And Somerset is saying the same things to the French ambassador. We only have that account. Um, we don't have the French ambassador's account of the meeting, unfortunately. Biased. All sources are biased. <laughs> um, if you show me a source that's not biased... I'll show you an honest politician <laughs> or an academic who doesn't talk too long. As you were talking, a, a most interesting talk. Oh, thank you. I was thinking about the target at which mm. propaganda was made. Yeah. And essentially, proclamations that would be given, uh, these would be read, presumably, mm. in different uh, towns. Yeah. Very good question. Um, I think that drawing on work in other European contexts, uh, the argument is going to be that basically the prof something like a proclamation is, is aiming everybody. So you're going from high down to low. What you then have on top of that is additional stuff for the elite, additional stuff for the real movers and shakers. Um, you're quite right that proclamations would have been read aloud. Um, in some cases, in some countries, we're beginning to see them printed in this period, which obviously increases their circulation. But uh, no evidence of that happening in Scotland, obviously, I'd love to find it. And it may, of course, have circulated in manuscript. Um, I think to go back to the question and sort of this incident with the French ambassador is... <laughs> I certainly want to stay alive for my dinner. I don't want to be electrocuted. Um, so I think that we have um, particular stuff that's being targeted at an opinion maker like an ambassador, which is in addition to the blanket coverage. 
Um, one thing I will emphasize though, although literacy levels in this period are relatively low, um, that's not necessarily an inhibition to access because we also know that in England and Scotland and France, there is a really strong culture of reading aloud and sharing things through the medium of group reading. Um, so we definitely shouldn't see printed text as somehow being more elite than spoken ones. They're all part of a continuum. But broadly speaking, the propaganda is all going the same way. They're not saying one thing to one group and another thing to another Ah, OK, I see what you mean now. Um, so the distinction here is what you're saying to people who are abroad and what you're saying to your own subjects. Right, so let's take the English. The English are saying to the Scots, oh, we believe that there's god godly marriage and, you know, Edward VI, Mary, it's meant to be a match made in heaven. What they're saying to their own people is, come on, you know we're overlords of the Scots, get up there and fight. Um, I would love to see that distinction in the Scots propaganda or the French propaganda as well. I've not found enough. Again, I'm, I'm sorry, I keep this on sort of saying, you know, there's not enough, it's early in the research, but both of those things are true. So I do think there's a domestic international split. That, that's definitely there. That's all right. No one else? I would not have thought that an ambassador would have immediate access to the higher echelons of authority. So how extraordinary was it for this three months to wait? Very good question. Um, now, what it looks like is that this is deliberate delaying on their part. Um, normally, an ambassador would have pretty quick access. Um, the things that split it up here and cause the delay are several fold. One is that the French Mason's gone to Paris to sort out various bits and bobs, you know, pick up his mail. The French court is having its Christmas festivities elsewhere. So there is a bit of a game of him trying to play catch up with the French court. And then they say, oh, it's Christmas time, it's Yule time. Um, even given all of that, I think the delay is exceptional. You know, a short delay, yes, but three months, that's a long time for him to wait. And the English Privy Council, the English Privy Council clearly think it's a long time as well, because they're sort of writing saying, well, haven't you seen them yet? You know, why, why haven't you seen them yet? And they assume he's being negligent, whereas I think he has been given the runaround a bit. Uh, I think uh, that we'd better call it uh, an evening. But thank you very much indeed for, uh, for your responses, everybody, and your questions. Back in the, uh, the 1980s, um, I was excavating one of the, the forts of the period of the rough wooing down at uh, Eyemouth, French and English fort, and uh, Marcus Merriman was known to turn up on occasion. Um, uh, quite an outrageous character in many ways, but a, a great scholar and a good friend. And I remember on more than one occasion um, refighting battles in a pub in Eyemouth with Marcus uh, using the back of one of his cigar packets. And from Marcus at that time, I learned to think of the wars of Rough Ruin as being the 16th century equivalent of the Vietnam War. It's nice to see that since the 1980s we've, we've moved on and updated our, our, the, the sort of comparisons we make. And much more to the point and much more important, um, it's splendid to see that, that uh, Amy can extract from the records a much more nuanced, much less black and white picture of what was really happening at a very complex period in our history, but a very, very important one. Uh, we've really heard a, a very, um, I'm going to use the word masterly, it doesn't seem quite appropriate, um, uh, but a, a very sort of uh, ladylike. Uh, uh, <laughs> you go with masterly, masterly, okay. Um, outline of, of a very complex and interesting period in our history. And uh, I hope you, uh, you join with me in thanking her very much for what such a splendid performance. Thank you.